Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Fago Maradi, and here in Huntsville, Alabama, at the very tail end of the Association of the United States Army's annual Global Force Symposium, the number one winter meeting of U.S. Army leaders from around the world to talk technology, budget, strategy, uh, and more with their industry counterparts, thought leaders, as well as media. Our coverage here is sponsored by L3 Technologies and Leonardo uh, DRS, and we're here on the Boeing stand uh, because it wouldn't be an AUSA if it wasn't talking to retired United States Army Lieutenant General Bill Phillips, who is uh, was. Uh, the senior most uh, uniformed acquisition officer in the uh, United States Army uh, once upon a time uh, and now is the vice president for Army and uh, special operations programs uh, based here in sunny Huntsville. Sir, it's always a pleasure. I'm glad we had an opportunity to catch up. Vago, it's great to see you again, and thanks for coming and sharing your time with the Boeing Company. Uh, it's uh, it's always uh, it's always a pleasure. Uh, so uh, first, I, I got to congratulate you. I know this is not your uh, not your basket, but uh, to congratulate you on the successful National Missile uh, Defense Test, because Boeing was the prime contractor uh, on that. Um, but I want to shift a little bit more to the sort of services acquisition portfolio, uh, and and how you guys are working to position yourself in that. Uh, obviously, you know you got National Missile. Uh, uh, defense, you have Chinook, you've got a, a, a Apache, a Little Bird, a whole bunch of programs across the board, directed energy as well. Uh, you know, we heard from uh, Jeff White, uh, the Army's uh, Deputy Acquisition uh, Secretary. Uh, you know, talk to us a little bit about how you guys are positioning yourselves and what are the key priorities and the messages you are both delivering, but also hearing from the senior Army customer you were meeting with, because pretty much we're talking to you at the very end of this because your calendar was completely booked talking to your uh, former counterparts. Well, Vago, thank you for coming and sharing your time with us. We're very excited about what the Army's going to do. Boeing's excited about bringing innovation for the Army, and that's what we've talked to many of our customers about since they've been here. But it's not just the Army. Uh, Boeing is involved in everything from space, all of the multi-domain operations, space, cyber, air, land, sea, uh, and we're excited to support all the services in various capacities. And uh, you also have undersea now, also because Ocean Voyager is yours now, uh, as well. From so from space to, to undersea, um, what are uh, some of the key messages? You know, I mean, we're at a time of transformation. The service is shifting from uh, counterinsurgency, understanding how important it is to preserve those skills, but also shifting to a great power mode. Uh, you see technological revolution happening as well, and now the Army itself is reorganizing itself with Futures Command. And I want to ask you a little bit more about that in a bit. But what what were some of the key messages that you were picking up from the senior leadership that's going to, you're going to take back into your organization and along with Leanne Corrett, figure out how you guys are going to adjust your sales. Well, Leanne's clearly focused on this as well, but what we are working on is uh, the Army's message to us was clearly we have to be prepared to fight tonight. Uh, and as we prepare to fight tonight with our current systems that are out there, we can't for forget about what's in the future. And through the Army Modernization Command and our discussions with General Murray and, and all of his team, the CFTs, et cetera, we're focused on bringing innovative ideas to the Army to be able to help them be successful in the various uh, cross-functional teams that are working on strategies, programs, and so forth. Boeing is excited about what we can do to help the Army be successful. And, and where where do you think uh, you have uh, the sort of the deepest uh, innovation magazines? So what are the specific areas you're going to work and engage with the Army to help solve some of their problems? Oh, a couple of those uh, rise to the top right away. The first one would be the Chief of Staff's number one priority, right? Long-range precision fires. And we think we have solutions that we might be able to bring to the table and, and help the Army be successful and really transform what artillery has done in the past and what it'll do in the future. The other one that rises to the top for us, gosh, we've been in the aviation business for over a, a hundred years. We're starting our second 100 year uh, and we're focused on future vertical lift uh, and everything that they, the Army is trying to do to bring the next generation of vertical lift aircraft to the table. Uh, and uh, we should also say that over uh, uh, the general's shoulder is uh, the aircraft that he once flew, uh, the CH-47. You're a very distinguished Army aviator uh, and uh, accepted and test flew a lot of the airplanes at the... Uh, you were going to work for Boeing. We were joking about this <laughs> earlier. It was only a matter of time you were going to work for Boeing, whether retiring over there at Ridley Park or uh, joining uh, the company later. Um, uh, let me ask you about Chinook. Um, I mean, the Army is looking at slowing down uh, that program uh, a bit. There were questions about Block 2. 
to uh, as well. Talk to us from a Boeing perspective what this does. It's a very robust running assembly line. You guys want to keep it as robust and running as possible, obviously, to reduce cost uh, and obviously, uh, you know, preserve that capability for the future because there is no capability set for in the new uh, hel helicopter uh, or vertical lift uh, recapitalization uh, arena. Full disclosure, Bell is one of our sponsors on that because I know you mentioned that as well. Uh, but uh, talk to us a little bit about what this means for potentially for Chinook, uh, given that it is uh, you know still a very very popular airplane, but a very important airplane for the U.S. Army as well. Critically important. This will be this aircraft will be around for a hundred years, uh, and it's not your my father's or my grandfather's Chinook. It is so much different today. It's been rebuilt, modernized. It's a modern platform with modern electronics and so forth in it. And the Block Two. How many programs give you this, uh, Vago? Cost schedule performance is how the Army manages programs and they measure their success by that. This program is on cost, it's ahead of schedule. Uh, we have built four EMD prototypes. The first one flew just a couple of days ago uh, and it's at the performance level that the Army requires. So it's meeting all the parameters that the Army desires. We are concerned about what the Army might do in terms of funding of the Block II going forward. Um, and, and for our audience, summarize the capability increase you have because it is a, a tremendous airplane with a tremendous amount of lift, payload, range, and speed capability. Talk to us about what Block II brings to the table. I'll give you one quick example for that. It uh, gives you a lot of capacity lift. Uh, and so look at it from this perspective. A JLTV that the Army's buying, the Marine Corps is buying also, uh, if you wanted to pick up a JLTV with a Block 1 aircraft, you could pick it up from here in Huntsville, the Von Braun Center, and maybe fly it to the next parking lot. That's about what you could do with a JLTV. If you wanted to fly it to Nashville, you would need a Block 2, which gives you that about 4,000 pounds in terms of additional lift capacity that would be able to fly a JLTV. Think about that in a combat environment and what you could do on a peninsula, and uh, the Korean Peninsula or elsewhere to be able to lift not only the JLTV, but also the M777 and its crew and its ammunition. It would take several Block 1 aircraft to be able to lift what a Block 2 could do in terms of carrying it any given distance. Um, how long is it going to be before uh, you're going to, I mean, obviously the budget proposal is just out, it's going to be debated. Uh, you know, what is the window where you're going to need uh, some commitments from the United States Army or the U.S. government uh, before it starts to really impinge both the facility but also the Block 2 program? Well, this year is critical, too, to be able to, to get production dollars uh, put into the budget going forward. Uh, but as we look in the out years, having dollars into procurement to actually transition from EMD into production will be critical for the Boeing company because that production line is going to start to be reduced in terms of the number of aircraft coming off of it. We've almost met the com complement of F models that are coming out of the production line. So now we're relying upon foreign military sales. And uh, the truth be known, Vago, there's just not enough FMS aircraft that are out there to be able to keep that production line viable at this point in time. Well, and uh, because no other customer in the world is going to acquire the aircraft in the in the volume, for in example, the volume, in the, in the yeah. as the United States Army is going to. And by the way, the soft the soft community also uh, will get their aircraft, and we are going to put those aircraft through the production line and give them to our special operations uh, warriors. Um, uh, uh, three questions, because I know you're going to have to go in there, and literally they're they're packing the joint up. Uh, first. Um, you know, we uh, t talk to us a little bit about uh, your sense on how the Army accomplished the night court process. Uh, certainly very innovative to get the entire leadership focused on what do we really need, what do we not need. Uh, it did uh, result in a lot of acquisition decisions at the end of the day, given, uh, you know, even though the service has more money, it has more requirements than, than it has money. Um, you know, how did you feel that process went by as somebody who sat uh, very often on the inside of that process trying to make some of these tough choices? Well, I, first thing, Vago, I'm not a fan of the PBBES BES process. Uh, so I think what the Army has done is sort of just blown that up in many ways. And they've reallocated the authority for managing uh, the various pegs within the Army. Uh, so I applaud the Army for what they've gone through in terms of aligning the, uh, the budget to meet the goals that the Secretary and the Chief had aligned for the Army. So Boeing is behind what, what they are doing, future vertical lift, long-range precision fires, uh, those programs will certainly receive the level of funding necessary to go f forward and to achieve the outcomes that the Army desires for them. So I think the night court is a very good process that the Army's gone through. 
Uh, what's difficult sometimes to understand is why the Army made the, the decisions they do on certain programs where they align, they either eliminate, stop, or realign them in some kind of way. And I think the Army, if they could get more information out to industry on why they made those decisions, uh, that's important. And they've done some of that at AUSA, so I applaud the Army for that. Uh, but there are still some questions that uh, that folks are asking, although we are still pretty early in the in the process. Uh, and I know that meeting, meetings are ongoing, and it also explains all the, uh, the very, very intense Tent meetings that were happening here uh, over the course of, of the week in all, in all the stands here. Um, let me ask you about Futures Command. We've talked about this multiple times. We talked about it at AUSA, uh, you know, uh, 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 the year before last, then we talked in Suffolk, and then we talked again in October. Yep. Uh, tell us a little bit, I mean, you know, we've got more granularity. You had some questions uh, across the process as somebody who was doing it. Um, you know, how do you feel this is going now, now that you are engaging with those folks on a much, much more regular basis? Well, Vaga, when you and I were at topic last year, I, I think I said I was cautiously optimistic. I'm even more optimistic today. AFC has stood up. They've achieved IOC. They're driving toward full operational capability. And I'm confident in what General Murray and the Army team is going to do in terms of modernization. And for those programs that they own, and having the budget realigned to be able to execute those programs, now the challenge for those CFTs is to really look at the requirements, make sure that they, they get the requirements as right as they can, and then once they lock them in, to be very disciplined in the way that they look at any changes to those requirements going forward. If you look at the history of the Army and why so many programs may have been killed or stopped, it's what I might describe as requirements creep going forward. Uh, some of the impacts that uh, cost schedule and performance. Uh, what are the impacts of those potential requirements changes to the cost of a program, the performance and timeline where there's an outcome that the Army expects and the schedule associated with that. Uh, so all those things, I think, have to be considered uh, uh, by the Army, and I'm confident in General Murray and his team that they're going to work to get it right. Another thing that's important to understand, they don't have all the programs. So General Murray, I believe, is managing a little over 30 programs or so through the various CFTs. So the rest of the programs are going to be managed by PEOs and PMs out in the Army, still executing what the Army wants, driving to those outcomes. Uh, you are, uh, last question, you are uh, 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 still teach uh, uh, very, very regularly. You talk to Army uh, PEOs and program managers who are coming in, uh, you know, drawing on your wealth of experience, both as an operator, but also as somebody who is in uh, the test community, but then also in the acquisition community. Um, you know, what are, what are some of the key lessons that you try to impart on them when you talk to them on a regular basis? You know, we were talking a little bit about MQ-25, yeah. which was a big Boeing win uh, in the Navy's program. The Navy had... Uh, two requirements, get in on and off a carrier and carry gas, uh, which was liberating. But what are some of the, you know, the advice that you pass on when you talk to uh, this new generation of, of, of Army acquisition professionals? Well, one, they have to learn from our mistakes of the past and then not repeat those mistakes. That's something that they, they must learn. And as we did some of the forensics on the MQ-25, I uh, had personal discussions with Hondo Gertz on how they did that. And then Admiral Richardson, his comments that were in the public release of when they made that decision, I think were telling in that they only had two KPPs. It must fly off the carrier, and then it must actually execute the refuel mission. And then there were other requirements in that, but they all fell below that. And the one thing that Admiral Richardson said that really resonated with me that I share with these young acquisition professionals, don't be afraid to talk to industry. Pull industry in, do that early up front. Make sure they have a chance to look at your requirements and then give you feedback on those requirements. Not in a normal industry day like we normally do where 20 companies will be out there and no one really says anything. Bring them in one-on-one, -on -one, have discussions with them, and they'll give you the honest feedback on what rights should look like, and that will help you refine your requirements. And uh, know when to say yes, but know when to say no. That's exactly right. I mean, cost schedule performance. Be prepared to say no if someone brings you something that doesn't make sense or is going to impact your program because the Army expects an outcome today, right? And anything that impacts that outcome, be cautious. Don't be a second late. Didn't, didn't one yes, senior sir. officer tell you that? We were, I won't mention a name, but we had a senior officer in here, and his comments to us were, if someone brings me a change to my requirement that causes them to be a second late, I'm going to say no.
Incredible. Sir, always a pleasure. Lieutenant General uh, Bill uh, Phillips, who is a uh, former Army, uh, you senior most uniformed acquisition executive, but now with uh, Vice President Army of Soft Programs at Boeing. Sir, always an honor and pleasure talking to you. I look forward to connecting with you in D.C. And, sir, honored to be here with you today. Thank you, Vago.